How did this chap get here? I mean, not here. We know that he came with me from home, didn't you? Yes, you did. But I mean to China, all the way from Europe. You're a very, very long way from home. Could it be on account of something which has had a profound effect on global politics, the economy and culture of the world, or because of a bunny with a broken GPS? I'll put my money on the first guess, which is otherwise known as the ancient Silk Road. Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty. That's the one that straddles the BC AD crossover when everyone had to buy brand new watches and it was really annoying. But it was also a time of many, many great innovations in China. Emperor Wu sent a certain chap by the name of Zhang Qian off to the west. Zhang took a 6,440 kilometer. Well done, ZQ. And just to give you an idea of how far that is, well, if I just got up now and kept walking without stopping to eat or sleep for about 280 days, yeah, you get the idea, right? So traders and travelers from every corner of Europe, the Middle East and Western Asia carried loads of gold, silver and other treasures, herbs, creatures and spices into China. Oh, they traded them along the route. Going in the other direction were the teas, the porcelain, China and of course, silk. For its unparalleled fine texture and glossy sheen, silk was the most renowned and in demand of all of China's products. Those outside of China knew not yet the secret of its creation. And who would ever have guessed it was from the silkworm, even with that name? So an unceasing flow of silk populated the roads across Europe and Asia. Incidentally, China was at that time referred to in Greek and Roman texts as the Kingdom of Silk. To buy a pound or about 450 grams of silk in Rome costs about 75 grams of gold. Yikes. No wonder then that it was a luxury and a sign of high status. Because of its value, normal Roman citizens were forbidden from wearing silk. The reason given was that its softness would detract the Roman man's fortitude and spirit. But there was no way that that lessened its appeal. One of China's four great inventions was paper. And after it entered the Persian Empire, it was just a matter of time before it found its way into Europe. The famous high-ranking monk, Xuanzang, went to India and wrote the Great Tang Records on the Western regions, a book which chronicled the administration, society and customs of India and its peoples. Interestingly, it's today a seminal text on India in the Middle Ages. Remember that the Chinese are well known for being very meticulous in their record keeping, more than anybody else. As for this Xuanzang chap, well, he was actually the role model for a character named Tang Song, a Tang Dynasty monk in a book called Journey to the West. Something akin to J.R.R. Tolkien's basing of Samwise Ganges on the British soldier. And Journey to the West is a seminal novel in Chinese culture. Hanging lanterns, another thing that was shared along the Silk Road, is now an entire festival in China, but was originally part of a religion known as Zoroastrianism and involved fire worship and lantern hanging. It was practiced by the Sogdians, who lived to the west of China in what is now modern-day Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. Because of the Silk Road, this festival is today an annual ubiquitous Chinese celebration, and a very beautiful one too. Now in China, there are some key cities on the Silk Road. For example, Jiangye, Dunhuang, Urumqi. And traveling between these places would often be a huge caravan of traders on camels crossing the deserts. And they were so vast, these caravans, safety in numbers was paramount, that they were almost like mobile cities in their own right. And huge melting pots of not just traders, but musicians, artists, chefs, writers, engineers, craftsmen, the list goes on. And it made them a huge melting pot for sharing knowledge and ideas and advancing the culture and technology all over the known world at that time. There are grottos carved in the natural caves and filled with ancient Buddhist artworks at the Morgau Caves in Dunhuang. The Jade Gate on the desert section of the Great Wall is also there. Even the manhole covers are still adorned with scenes from the ancient Silk Road. It's that authentic. There is also the unique rainbow-colored Danxia Mountains and the skyline of modern-day downtown Urumqi. Now, although there are no caravans that travel the Silk Road in the modern day, 
these ancient places still bear the influences of many cultures flowing together. The ancient Silk Road today is not in use, but only because there are so many more forms. The caravan has taken to the rails with high-speed trains, to the skies and to the seas, and China's Belt and Road Initiative means that the connection with the world that the old Silk Road used to carry has now gone global. So let's hope that the ideas and exchange of culture continues to happen and that we remember that every new culture we meet is a chance to learn something new. Like us, subscribe, leave some comments, let us know what you think and we'll get right back to you. All right, and remember, most importantly, keep it open. See you next time.